I've worked as a park ranger for a little under 10 years, most of which I spent working at Yosemite National Park. Honestly, this job is pretty mundane most of the time. The most exciting things being random deer mutilations and teenage party sites. One day, however, I was doing my usual rounds and making sure everyone was out of the public facilities for the night. I was locking up the doors to the bathrooms when I heard what I thought was a little girl whispering. It was ever so faint, and if it wasn't such a still day, I wouldn't have heard it. I sat there for a moment and didn't hear anything further, so I started walking to where my truck was parked to make my way to my next stop. When I heard it again, a faint whisper of a little girl. I stopped and looked around and listened very closely. Yet, again, I couldn't hear anything, nor could I see anything. Starting to feel a little creeped out, I quickly made my way to the truck and hopped in. I started the truck up and began to quickly take off when I saw it. A ghostly figure of what I can only describe as an emaciated female. She had long pale limbs with a rubbery looking skin. Her eyes were pitch black and mouth gaped wide open like her jaw was broken. I freaked the hell out and floored it out of there like a bat out of hell. I didn't lock the gate for that area and got in some serious shit the next day for it, but there was no way in hell I was going to face whatever ghost, demon, monster thing that was. I've never seen or heard anything like that since, and I really hope I never do again. Being a forest ranger isn't always as cool as it sounds. Usually, it's pretty boring and can get very redundant. But, on occasion, we see some pretty spooky things out here in the Ocala National Forest. The story I'm going to share with you today happened somewhere around the Lake George area. Recently, I have been extra vigilant while roaming the woods. We have had several reports of what people thought could be an exotic pet loose. Some people reported seeing a chimpanzee, and others, a Bigfoot. I had been looking for any sign of chimp or chimpanzees in the area, scouring the ground for droppings, looking through the trees, etc. I honestly thought people were just freaked out by the recent pictures of what some lady alleged was a skunk ape. I felt like it sparked a reaction of hysteria. I've personally never been one to believe much of the Bigfoot stuff, but this day still makes me think twice sometimes. As I was exploring around Lake George, I heard what sounded like a very large branch snap from high above me. I couldn't quite place where it came from, since the birds were very loud that morning. I tried to shrug it off but I have this incredible feeling of being watched. I started to walk back towards the way I came, when suddenly, the wits went quiet. No birds, no bugs, not even the wind. Just eerie silence. I heard another branch snap, but this time, much closer than before. I began to really get nervous, because I have never experienced the woods this silent before not even with bobcats, panthers, or wolves around. I began to walk at a brisk pace to try and not look like fleeing prey, but I get about 200 feet away when I hear a loud wailing, which I can only describe as monkey-like. Suddenly, sticks and rocks are being tossed at me from the tops of the trees and a whirlwind of noise erupts. I run as fast as I possibly can to get to my vehicle and get the hell out of there. The thing that freaks me out the most though is that there was nothing in the trees. They were completely empty. I looked up and it was fall time so most of the trees were pretty bare. I still have no idea what happened that day. And I just don't really talk about it because I don't want to sound insane.
I have worked as a forest ranger for some time now. I've not seen too many crazy things, but the things I have seen are absolutely terrifying to me. Me and another ranger were assigned to escort an archaeologist around the park to survey some areas for a potential dig site for some project or something. Honestly, these things are really boring, so I didn't really pay much attention to them. We were climbing a slight incline to get a better viewing point of the valley. We sat up there for about 20 minutes taking pictures and samples of the dirt and whatnot. Seemingly out of nowhere, archaeologist guy starts yelling for us to come over frantically. We come and see what the fuss is about, and he is pointing into the valley at what seems to be a bear walking on two legs carrying a deer on his shoulders, seemingly effortlessly. I wasn't really too phased by this, and made light of it, saying it was more than likely a bear. But, the other ranger was pale-faced and looked horrified. He said that was no bear, and that thing was running with the deer on his shoulders directly at us. We all started to panic, and scrambled to get to our ATVs and take off like we had seen Satan himself. Don't know if we saw a Bigfoot or a deformed bear that day, but it honestly scared the crap out of me. I am an avid hunter. I go every season and I love it. More often than not, I don't kill any game, but I just love getting out and into the woods. I don't know if you're familiar with hunting season in Pennsylvania, but during late November, rifle season is in full swing. It was already the second week of the season, and I had yet to bag any deer, so I was eager to get to it early in the morning, and I did. I normally get up at around 5 a.m. and drive to my hunting spot. It's private land that my grandfather owns. Him and I are the only two to hunt on it, and the rest is posted to hunters. And the only others on that land are employed on my grandfather's farm. I had originally planned on calling my grandfather when I woke up and asking him if he wanted to tag along, but the weather was more than horrendous in the morning. The snow was pouring down and the wind was really strong. I love hunting in the snow, but it almost made me decide not to go. So I knew he wouldn't want to. The roads were really bad, so it took me a bit longer to drive there. Normally, the sun would be starting to rise by now. However, it was overcast and snowing. Regardless of the snow, I walked up to my spot. It was directly behind my grandfather's house, over a hill and back about 100 to 150 yards. Almost immediately upon sitting in my spot, I hear things moving all around me. Honestly, I didn't pay too much attention to it. It could have been a number of things, but it was still pitch black, and the thought of it was kind of creeping me out. But there wasn't much I could do. It's not like I can shoot at anything, so I just ignored it and continued to wait. It wasn't much longer after that that I began hearing something walking just over the ridge to my right. At this point, there was barely enough light to see my feet, so even if it was a deer, there was still nothing I could do. However, I could tell it wasn't a deer. I just assumed it was my grandfather, walking to a spot, which is just a short walk from mine. But the lights in the house were off, and if he was up here, I'm sure he'd let me know prior. Even if it wasn't him, I, it, it was a hunter, albeit hunting illegally. I still wanted to let him know I was here, so I turned on my flashlight and pointed into his direction, flashing it several times. Again, even if it was a deer, I couldn't shoot it, so I felt it was better to be safe rather than sorry. Nothing happened after that. After I flashed my light, the noise stopped, which was really odd. I didn't see them turn back or hear them, so I figured... They either A, sat down right there after seeing my light, which was considered extremely rude, or B, I didn't hear them walk off. I just assumed it was the latter. An hour or so passes, and finally the first sights of daylight start to shine through. It's still snowing, and the snow is falling in entire snowballs, rather than snowflakes, so visibility is pretty limited. I, around this time, 
noticed that an odd-looking lump protruding from a group of trees. The shrubs atop the hill that separates me and my granddad's house, right where I had movement earlier. It looked like a mound of dirt. However, it was sticking out from the side of a tree, so obviously it wasn't dirt. Naturally, I raised my rifle to take a closer look. I could tell immediately that I was looking at the side of an older style camouflage coat. It took a minute, but it finally clicked. That was a person over there. I just thought it was a hunter, so I didn't know what to do about it. I knew if he was hunting on our land illegally, and from that I could see he wasn't wearing anything orange, which is required of all hunters during the rifle season. And I could tell just from looking, whoever this was wasn't my grandfather. I sat there for a minute debating my next move, but I decided to call my granddad, at the risk of blowing his stunt if that was actually him over there. So, without taking my eyes off this guy, I pulled out my phone and dialed his number. To my dismay, he picked up, and I told him what was going on. So, he told me that he'd make his way up, but I decided on my own to give this guy a whistle, to let him know I see him. But he didn't react at all. After a few minutes, I started to walk up to this guy. After walking a short distance, I could clearly see this guy, who was sound asleep tucked in between a shrub and a couple of trees. He obviously thought out here was a great place to lay down, as I would never be able to see him and his coat was not stuck out, and as I thought, he had no orange on. I gave him another whistle, much louder, and he woke right up, almost immediately shuffling over to hide his exposed coat. He had a nasty, scruffy beard and a gray hat. Honestly, he looked like a harmless hom old homeless man, probably in his 50s, but he had a perfect view of my granddad's home from his spot, and I had a pretty good idea that he was planning to do once my granddad left the house. Once this guy realized he'd been caught, and he'd saw a 6'5 mad guy carrying a rifle, he started freaking out. His face went pale, and almost instantly he tried to feed me some bullshit that he'd gotten lost during a drive with a group of other hunters. A drive as a coordinator pushed through a thicket in order to drive deer to hunters sitting at the edge of a designated driving area. However, the closest public game land is miles from this spot, so I knew it was a lie. He just wanted to keep on going on about how he was lost and how he fell asleep. He even went as far to make up a fake name on the spot. I just stood there and listened, making sure he didn't give me any fishy movements. I couldn't help but think that what this guy was going to do to my grandfather. God knows if he had the chance, and the thoughts pissed me off. In 2004, I was 15 years old living in central Minnesota. I had hunted on my grandparents' property east of Sandstone since I was 12 and had been fairly successful each year. That season was the same as most, going hunting with my dad and older brother for opening weekend and then trying to get out hunting whenever I could after that. I think it was around the second weekend when I had one of the most scariest experiences of my life. On this particular day, after an unsuccessful morning hunt, my brother and I were walking back to the main house through the woods and decided to walk out to the road instead of trudging through a snowy field. Parked on the property, about 40 yards off the road, was a pickup truck. We didn't recognize it. We approached cautiously, but the truck was abandoned and there were tracks leading off into the woods in several directions. In the front of the dash was a pile of mail addressed to someone with the last name Gamble, a name not associated with any of my family or nearby neighbors. My brother and I decided that we'd just head back home and let our dad know about it since there was little else we could do or knew what to do. When we said the name we had seen in the window on the mail, my grandmother immediately recognized the name. Oh, that's a lady who lives a few miles away from here. My dad jumped on the four-wheeler to go see if the truck was stuck or broken down and offered to help. But when he got down there, a mere 20 minutes after my brother and I initially saw the truck, it was gone. Without any cause for alarm, we all basically forgot about it as we had a warm lunch and swapped hunting lie stories from the morning. After a post-lunch nap, we all mapped out the morning hunting strategies and we headed out to our stands until dark. This is when the story gets good. I was sitting in my stand, 
lost in thought but constantly gazing around and trying to spot movement or flashes of brown and white. I was deep in thick brush on the edge of a swamp that borders a hardwood stand on trees. It was a favorite spot for the afternoon hunts to get deer as they migrate towards the fields as it gets dark. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flash of brown to my right. I strived to identify exactly what it was. Before I saw it again as it slipped behind a pile of brush once again. I figured it'd be about 50 yards away and moving my way. I lifted my 3030 Western Field lever action to my waist as I stood in the stand and silently slipped the safety to my off position. For several long minutes, I saw and heard nothing. I began to question if I had seen anything at all or if my imagination was finally taking over after me being fooled by squirrels for several hours, when suddenly I heard a low noise coming from the thick brush. It sounded like a growl growl sound. My first thought was that a wounded deer was going through its dying moments from the neighbor's property to the east. Suddenly, the low growl turned into a distinct growl and snarl. My mind immediately went from lurking for a wounded deer to looking for a bear. It wasn't uncommon to see bears in the area, but the thought of one being so close was both exciting and nerve-wracking to a 15-year-old me. The growls grew louder, and I saw the brush move slightly as the unseen bear moved closer to my stand. I placed the safety back on my weapon, but kept it at my waist. The growling stopped, and then it turned into a snarl and screaming sound that caused my heart to immediately drop in my chest in pure fear. I had never heard a bear make that sound, and I suddenly knew it was a wild cat of some sort. The brush movement that I finally saw the animal for the first time. About 35 yards away, I had gone from expecting a deer to a bear to a wildcat of some sort, and while I wasn't wrong, I did not expect in the least what I saw in front of me. 35 yards away, in the woods of Minnesota on a November day, was a Bengal tiger that had been 8 feet long, with orange and black stripes. A Bengal tiger. I had seen them in books and at the zoo, but I had no frame or reference of what I was witnessing. I immediately threw up my gun. I turned the safety off and the hammer cocked. My hands shook and I thought I was going to throw up. While it was likely less than 30 seconds, I felt like I was staring in shock at the tiger for at least an hour before it snarled, screamed once more and bounded into the woods to the north. I stood in my stand for several minutes, until my leg shaking became paralyzing as the adrenaline wore off and the reality of what just happened came over me. I asked myself over and over if I had just seen something that was real. In my frozen fear, I had contemplated shooting the apparition in front of me since in my sights the entire time, but I didn't because I wasn't convinced that it was really real. I didn't have a cell phone, so contacting my brother or dad was impossible to do. But I do know one thing, I did not want to be in the woods in the dark with that thing nearby. I was also less than eager to immediately get down and walk to the house with him nearby. So I sat in the stand for 20 minutes in the ready position looking for any sight of the tiger. When I didn't see anything, I got out of my stand and started the longest walk back to the house possible. I walked the entire one fourth mile through the woods with the gun up in the ready position. Every twig breaking made me feel like a tiger was leaping towards me in the growing darkness. Needless to say, my family was skeptical when I rushed to tell the story of the evening's hunt. They believed I had seen something, but the tiger part was hard to swallow. They figured it was likely a wildcat or a mountain lion at most, but I insisted that I had seen what I had seen. Regardless, we began to get ready for Wednesday night church, and the conversation continued until we got inside church. The small country church is composed of mostly extended family members, and so we had several relatives visiting for hunting that were mingling and talking about their hunts thus far. I immediately walked up to my cousin Skye, who owned and hunted the land adjacent to my grandparents. My dad jokes that he heard a ridiculous story that I made up about my evening. I was barely into the story when my cousin exclaimed, Oh, you saw the tiger too. My dad was floored and I was vindicated. Slowly, the story began unfolding with answers. The white truck belonging to the Gambles was the connection piece. 
Cynthia Gamble lived several miles from our property and owned a large wildcat sanctuary. While the cats were all in cages and tied with GPS monitors, apparently one had escaped and several neighbors reported seeing it. She went and looked for it, and by the following day, we had heard from those that knew the Gambles that the cat had been returned, but there was never any official word that had gotten loose. Being that far out in the country, with little population and evil lighter traffic, sightings of the cat by others than the family are limited if they happened at all. Everything went back to normal and I had a killer story to share with no one that believed. I went camping with three of my buddies, John, Bennett, and Kyle. We do this every year. It's kind of a bro trip to reconnect with each other. We were all fresh out of college and decided to go to our yearly camping trip in August. We are from Oregon and ended up camping in the woods there like we usually do at the same point. The first day was great. We set up our spot, explored the area, and by the time the sun was setting, we set up a campfire and made dinner. After a few too many beers and some s'mores, we decided to go to sleep. It was a perfect way to end the day. Our second day was basically the same thing. Hiking, food, one too many beers. But this night, we ended up being not so perfect. I remember watching some videos on YouTube. And we were laughing and it was interesting. As we finished the rest of the beers, we were wrestling around with each other like guys do, and John stopped messing around and froze. Everyone was confused, but John claimed he heard something nearby. I told him it was most likely a squirrel, and he said, no, it was most definitely not. He was scaring me at this point, and I decided to resume the tackling session, and I took him down. We forgot about the whole thing until about 10 minutes later. We were tired from wrestling and joking around, so we decided to put the fire out and head into the tent. We had a six-person tent for anybody wondering, so we were all in one tent. Just as our only light source besides our flashlights went out, I heard a slight cackle. I assume it was one of those boys because we were all clearly a bit buzzed, so everything is fine. I wanted to see what was so funny, so I turned the flashlight directly into Bennett's face. I thought he was the one laughing. Bennett's face was white as a ghost. He looked at me and said, Did you guys hear that? I said, The laughing? And Kyle said, That wasn't you. We were all shaken and decided to go into the tent, silent. As we got into the tent, I pulled out an axe that I used to cut the wood. It was the only source of protection we had. I was on the very end of the tent with Kyle and John, and in the middle was Bennett. We were all silent, but... I knew we were all wide awake after hearing the laughing. We weren't exactly at an actual campsite, where there were other people around. We just walked into the woods, found an open spot and set up camp here. We were about a mile from our car with barely any cell signal, so I guess you could say we weren't exactly in the safest position if there was a crazy maniac around. I got tired, so I dozed off. I have no idea how long I was sleeping before I heard laughing again. It's hard to describe other than it sounded menacing. It was frozen, and I didn't move. I didn't even try to look over to see if my buddies were awake. The axe was under my pillow. As I mustered enough strength to move to get the axe, I saw what looked like someone's finger pressed up against the tent, circling around the tent. Someone was definitely outside, walking around our tent, laughing. When they got to the front part of where the tent entrance was, they stopped. About five seconds went by before the person furiously shook the tent and screamed. That's when I knew my buddies were awake as well because Kyle screamed like a little girl right after. Whoever was behind the tent laughed and again walked off. We laid there the rest of the night, wide awake and definitely sober. We didn't want to move out of pure fear that whoever was out there was still there. When the sun came up, we packed up everything and walked back to our car. We still go camping every year, but this time we go to legit camping sites. I now bring a judge or a gun with me, and not just an axe. Whoever was outside our campsite could have easily been a deranged homeless person, psychopath serial killer, meth head, or just an asshole playing a prank on us. But I sure as hell won't camp in a rural place anymore. Stay safe out there. It's a dangerous world we live in.
November last year, me and my friend decided to drive up a car to Scotland to do some fishing and eventually make our way to Edinburgh. After the first day of catching some salmon and brown trout, we stored our catchers in the cooler box. After contemplating whether to sleep in the car tonight, as we had left quite late to set up camp, at around 4.30ish and the sun was going down, eventually, I said, let's set up a fire and cook the fish. I didn't drive all the way to Scotland to sleep in the car. My friend agreed as we set off looking for a spot to camp. We found a little wooded area next to a car park near a farm. We looked into it prior and apparently you can basically camp anywhere in Scotland as long as you left the place as you found it. So we grabbed all of our shit out of the car and started setting up our campsite. 20 minutes later we had a fire going, two fold up chairs and two tents up. My tent was out of view from my friend. This will be relevant later. We were glad we chose to camp outside instead of sleeping in the car as we smoked a few joints and we reminisced about school, life, and etc. My friend struggled to keep his eyes open as I checked my phone. 2 a.m. he called it, a night crawling into his tent and zipping it shut. I sat there with my feet up on my friend's now empty chair, listening to sounds of the wildlife. I shut off the torch and had hung up on the tree next to us, leaving it in the darkness, apart from the burning embers from the coal. It must have been three or so minutes before I started to hear the crunching of leaves and snapping of twigs that seemed to be coming toward me. Being a quite rational person, I passed it off as a fox drawn to the scraps of food we might have laying around. I was quickly proven wrong when I heard a sniffle, like someone with a coal clearing their nose. My high quickly turned from chilled out to paranoia as I feel a heavy dread come over me. My mind raced. Why the fuck would someone be here in the woods at 2 to 3 a.m.? Why are they coming towards me? I slowly reached down the pocket and felt my heart drop as I didn't feel the smooth blade of my pocket knife. Shit, I must have left it in the tent. All the while I hear the treading coming closer and closer and my heart beat racing. Out of the darkness I see a middle aged man, clean shaven, parted hair, around 5'10 slowly creeping toward me, almost in all fours like a predator, trying to stay out of sight. I sat there paralyzed, unable to speak. My mouth was so dry that I could hardly swallow. That's when I realized he hadn't even seen me. Being under the tree with no light source, I must have blended in. Also, with there only being one tent in view, I guess he thought my friend was the only one camping here. He got closer to the tent and half breathed and half whispered, Come on, do it, in a raspy voice. Creep the fuck out and unable to bear the thought of what he might do next. Oi! Can I help you? He jumped up in shock, and his whole demeanor changed. He looked at me mumblingly awkward as he scurried back out of the woods. I sat there, still trying to comprehend what had just happened and what I saw. Then I saw headlights of a car turn on and drive away. I woke my friend up, and he could not tell what had happened, but he could see how shook up I was. Without full explanation from me, he willingly grabbed all our gear and we slept in the car that night with the doors locked. We live in a small town, on the outskirts of a large city. It's a small street and a few small forests nearby. Me and my best friend, who at the time were maybe seven, were over at our other good friend's house. We opened the back fence door and his dog ran off. This was odd because she was very well trained. She never disobeyed him. So we waited outside in the driveway. We were facing toward the creek in his backyard, and behind the creek was another street than a small forest. We turned the corner around his little shed to look over. Since we enjoyed the view, we see something massive walking between the two trees. It seemed to hide behind one after we saw it. Both me and my friend almost peed ourselves. This thing was massive, seven or eight feet and covered in hair and it had a weird disfigured face. Now, you might be thinking this is just a child's imagination, but my friend saw it too, so I can't really write it off as just that. I didn't really have a wild imagination either. Even when I did, I could always tell the difference between that inside my head and what the real world was, and I never really exaggerated either. Plus, my friend saw it too, 
So, I know it's true. Still to this day we talk about what we saw in the woods that day. We don't really know what it was or what it could be. But it definitely is one of the creepiest things I have ever experienced. My friend and I live in the southeastern area of Wisconsin. We love to go Bigfoot hunting. My friend lives in a subdivision near some woods. And we go to an empty lot and throw rocks and bash logs on the side of trees. We never really had an encounter until we decided to stay late and possibly stay the night. It was about 10.30 and I was about 5 feet away from the edge of the forest, just throwing rocks. But I stopped as I heard something moving very slowly through the woods. The rustling stopped and a rock the size of a softball came flying towards me. It landed about 1 or 2 feet away from me. I took this as a warning and yelled to my friend that we needed to go. We began sprinting towards our bikes when we heard it running through the brush. It sounded like a bear or something shaking the trees. As we rode our bikes away, my friend asked, What the heck was that? I was too scared to speak. My friend and I never slept that night. The next day, we did some research, and nearby there have been quite a few Bigfoot sightings. We know it wasn't a bear, because bears don't live this far south in Wisconsin. Some of you may not believe this, but just know, I swear to God, I'm not lying. Being a forest ranger, I have seen a lot of creepy and unexplainable things in the woods. To save your time, I will spare you all the little encounters, and just share the one encounter that sticks with me day to day. I was walking deep within the woods. I was trying to map my way out and do an excursion, kind of on my off time. I didn't get very much time off from the park, so any time that I could just get off into the woods by myself and camp was definitely time that I utilized. I was walking through the woods, trying to find my way to where I wanted to go, I would usually go off trail, and I was struck by this weird feeling. I kind of felt like I was being watched. But I kind of shrugged it off as me just, you know, maybe being paranoid or something. I found a nice little clearing about 500 feet up, and I decided this is where I will do camp for the day. I started setting up my tent, and got a fire going. Soon, it began to begin dark. As I was sitting around the fire, cooking some hot dogs that I had brought along the way, I noticed that feeling of being watched came again. But here's the creepy part. Most people would say that they see these creepy eyes or these crazy colors in the sky or whatnot. I didn't see anything like that. But what I saw was something much more terrifying. What looked like to be a man hanging from a noose was just on the outside of the light of my camp. All I could see was the silhouette of two feet dangling about six feet up in the air. What was really odd is that none of these trees had branches. These were all pine trees. So, I freaked the hell out. I shot my flashlight there, but there was nothing there. Maybe I was just worrying, and I was overtired or something. So, I go back in my tent and try to sleep it off. I have nothing but nightmares and awful dreams all night and wake up at probably about 6 in the morning. The sun is starting to come up so I pack my stuff quickly and get the hell out of there. Out of all my years being in the woods and being a survivalist and things of that nature, I still have no idea what that was. When I was young, I was one of those kids who was all about being outdoors. I was in the Boy Scouts as soon as I was old enough to join, and stayed in until I was 18. In Boy Scouts, there is a group called the Order of the Arrow, or OA. To my young mind, 
It was like the special forces of scouting, and I was so excited when I was told I had been selected to join their prestigious ranks. So, I packed my bags and went to camp at Dale Wrestler, New Mexico, and I was ready to see what I would have to do to become an OA. To join OA, you have to go through a trial weekend. I will say not much more of that because the trials that we had to go through are secret. The last night though, we were split up into groups of four, given map coordinates, a compass, and a bare bone minimum of what we would need and told to survive for the night, and then to report to a second set of coordinates in the morning. Myself and the three scouts started on our way, and we were hiking for about five hours before we found a small clearing and confirmed it was our camping spot. From the northeast to the east, there was a thick thorny bramble. We tried to find a way to explore it, but the waist-high vines were impossible to get through without something to cut them. So we ignored it and went on just exploring a bit around the camp and goofing off. As night came, we all started to set down and to make a fire. This would be our only source of light for the night. We stayed up for a bit after dark, chatting and telling stupid jokes, and just having fun, talking before we went to bed. We had one small tent, and so myself and one of the other scouts slept outside near the fire, while the other two slept inside. I don't remember the time, because none of us had packed a watch, but it was well after the fire had gone out. I was shaken awake by one of the other scouts. He whispered in a quiet voice, that would sometimes crack with fear. Th th there's someone outside our campsite. He then pointed up. Moving from north to east outside the clearing was a bright blue ball of light. The odd thing was, the core was bright, but did not seem to cast a light on the trees. It was more like glowing than producing light per se. I stared at it, nervously and curious as he quietly belly crawled and woke the other two up. It is just some other group messing around, one of the other scouts said as he rubbed the sleep from his eyes, not trying to be quiet like the first one or I had. The light didn't seem to do anything different from its motions as the fourth scout said, but wait, that is where the bramble is. It was then that we realized how smooth the light was moving and how dead quiet the forest around us was. Nothing was making a noise, and not even the moving light. I watched it for some time before accidentally falling asleep again. When I woke up, everyone else was already packing to make it to the rendezvous point. They said that whatever it was last night made them feel scared, and I was the only one to sleep after seeing it. The rest had remade the fire before it faded away, and they stayed up on watch. Sadly, this is where the excitement of the story ends. We packed up and made it to the point without incident. Before I start the story, let me give you a little insight on myself. I grew up in a very military strict family. From the moment I turned five, my dad taught me everything I know now, from fighting to survival skills. My dad being an ex-Navy SEAL, nothing really scares me. I'm not trying to paint myself as the most fearless person in the world, but I am also a paranormal investigator. Not something I talk about at work, but after having my fair share of experiences, I grew to love it, and it always interested me. So, from putting away some of the worst people in the world, and my fair share of seeing the creepiest shit, nothing honestly scares me. This story takes place several summers ago. Two of my friends, Craig and Justin, Justin also being in law enforcement, and the other a firefighter, decided to go camping. I always felt so comfortable in the woods. As I said, my dad taught me everything I know. We would spend days in the woods just living off the land. My friend knew of a very remote area up in New Hampshire. I don't recall the location. I was actually really excited because I hadn't been camping in years. It took us some time to find a good spot to get a good idea of the area. I felt like we were in another planet entirely. 
We set up our tents, gathered up some firewood, and all of us had brought MREs to eat. We sat around talking for what felt like hours. We all grew pretty tired and decided to head to bed. I settled into my tent and quickly passed out. I was awoken by probably 3 a.m. to this horrible feeling. The only way to explain it is the need to fight or I was about to die. Now, I always carry a gun on me, my Beretta 92S. It really never leaves my side. I sat up and looked around my tent. It was small enough that there wasn't much space. Here's the creepy part. I remember my father used to tell me to listen to the woods. The animals and night crawlers, they will go silent if something's wrong. You won't hear a single thing. And that's it. I heard nothing. The first time in my life I felt fear. I have had my fair share of demonic hauntings and this doesn't even come close. I peered out of the tent. We had set the tent up on a good elevation facing an open field, about a hundred yards or so away. Mind you, it was full moon and bright as heck. Something was standing there. I can only begin to describe this thing as a mammal half lizard thing. The best way I can describe it is that it looked like half of the body of a horse. It had a lizard-like face and what I can only describe as spikes coming from the back and one hell of a set of teeth. At first, I seriously thought someone was in a costume messing with us, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was getting from this thing, an unearthly one. I did notice it, looks, it was looking at something. I couldn't make out what kind of animal it was, but it was probably the size of a raccoon. It looked like it was trying to sneak by, but the animal just randomly fell on its side and just let this thing take it. I was absolutely terrified. I knew if this thing headed our way, no 9mm is going to do anything to it. I could even hear it breathing all the way from my tent. What only sounds like something breathing through pudding. I crawled to my friend's tent keeping a low profile. In a small relief I noticed my friend Craig was also awake. He was looking at the same thing I was. We waited as the thing just stood there looking around. Then, it started to make its way for the tree lines. We could hear it smashing through the trees, and then silence. Craig and I just laid there for what felt like hours until the sun came up. Still, absolutely terrified. Justin woke up. Of course, he heard nothing, and not believing a single word of what we said. We packed up that day, and I have never been back to those woods. I seriously was always afraid to tell this story. I'll probably be sent for a psych evaluation and I don't care because I am not making this crap up. I'm a 17 year old male living in the Midwest. My sophomore year of high school, my friends peer pressured me into joining the track team. I thought that this was a good idea because I wanted to improve my stamina. So, due to this fact, I was asked to join the long distance track team. To practice, our small team would run in the woods and then to a lake. These woods are mostly used for off-road biking, so we would run in the forest in the dirt paths that the bikes would make. After school, we would run in these woods every day. Time to time, we saw deer. These deer would get very close, so much so that one would only need to take three or four feet to maybe even pet one. These woods were fun to run in because they could be so secluded. The last day I ran in these woods, it was just another day. Due to my poor stamina, I was pretty far behind the rest of the group and I had produced a fairly painful side cramp. In fact, I stopped to take a breather. Let me give you a layout of the path I was on. The bike path is cut into a slope, dividing it into two parts. The upper half is surrounded in trees, and above that is just more woods. The other half of the slope leads to ponds and more woods. As I was admiring the nature, I heard a loud snap high up in the woods. In so many scary stories, people say they get that feeling where they feel dread or the hair on their neck stands up. This feeling is very real, as I got this feeling. Turning around, 
I accepted to see deer, yet, to my utter horror, I saw a man. The man was pretty far away, but I saw his jeans and long sleeve checkered shirt. A bit of background on myself, I am currently a third degree black belt in Taekwondo, going on 15 years of practicing martial arts. Still, with my knowledge of self-defense, I was put off and began a light jog. To my utter horror, the man began to sprint down the hill. The creepiest part of his sudden sprint was how he used the trees to propel himself. I suddenly realized why he was running. He was trying to cut me off. Realizing I could not outrun him, I said a silent prayer as I ripped off an old stick of a fallen tree. The man finally made it down the hill. I was face to face with what I believe was a homeless man. The smell was very pungent. His eyes were bloodshot, and he had unkept a beard. I warned him to fuck off, and I raised the stick. The man smiled and said words I will never forget. All I want to do is play. At this comment, I closed the distance, delivering a kick into his groin. He moaned and began to stumble. I brought down the stick as hard as I could, breaking it over his head. The man fell on the path. With utter fear in my heart, I ran as hard and as fast as I could. My coach was waiting for me at the end of the forest path. She could see that I looked fearful and asked me what was wrong. I smiled weakly and told her nothing, and I decided not to tell my coach anything because I didn't think she'd believe me. After a few days, I decided to tell my parents, who immediately told me to tell my coach. I told her the next practice, and we did not run in those woods again. To this day, over a year later, I still have decided not to enter those woods. In the fall of 2016, a friend and I decided to go hiking late in the afternoon in a densely wooded wilderness area in the mountains not far from Fayetteville, Arkansas. My friend Rick was close to 60 at the time and recovering from a triple bypass he had undergone around 16 months earlier. We had been hiking these trails for about a year following his operation to strengthen his cardiovascular health. That day, a weekday, I hiked with a bottle of water, my wallet, and my keys, but nothing else. Nothing to protect myself. The trail we picked is a popular weekend hiking spot that we had taken dozens of times before. We were both comfortable with the hike and had never had a problem on that path, or any other for that matter. While Rick is older, and at the time a little more feeble after his health problems, I was in my mid-40s, well over 6 feet tall, and in pretty good shape. So, I wasn't really very worried about our safety. The trail we were on is on a state park adjacent to Federal Park land. It's an outdoors enthusiast dream. Most of our trek that day was completely uneventful. We just enjoyed the autumn leaves and chatted casually as the sun dropped lower in the evening sky. We had seen nobody else that day, which was probably to be expected given that we chose to hike late on a weekday. We'd completed about four miles of the six mile loop up to that point, and it was as uneventful as any other. On our way back to the car, and about two miles from park area, we spotted someone. Through an opening in the trees I saw a young woman probably a college student. She was on the trail ahead of us, and moving in our direction. At first glance, I paid her very little attention. As the distance between us disappeared, that changed. I did not know her, so I could not have mistaken, but there was something about her posture and expression that just seemed off. As she got closer, it struck me that she had some semi-panicked look on her face and was moving quite quickly. But she was in athletic gear, so maybe she was just doing some cardio or something. She occasionally turned her head and stared over her shoulder. I followed her eyes and eventually noted that another woman about 50 yards behind her was walking up the path through the trees. The second woman was not wearing hiking gear. In fact, her clothing struck me as totally inappropriate. It was a warm afternoon, and we were all well inside a wooded state park area for miles away from any homes but she was wearing semi-formal, offish casual attire, and a light jacket. 
I thought the clothes must have been secondhand because they were tattered and ill-fitting, and they definitely didn't look washed. She was a fit, athletic-looking woman, who couldn't have been more than 25 or 30 years of age. It was too bizarre. The clothes were wrong for the trail, and they were wrong for the age. Everything about her was off. Her shoes struck me as being even more peculiar. When she got closer, I noticed she was wearing scuffed, leather flats, casual shoes with no ankle support. I found it completely odd, because you just don't see people on this trail just as she was, and you never see them wearing shoes like that. My hiking partner, Rick, hadn't appeared to notice anything odd, as he was completely involved in the conversation and just kept talking. The second woman briefly glanced up, and we made eye contact as she neared us. The alarm bells were going off in my head. There was something in her eyes that made me feel uncomfortable. I don't know what she was thinking, if I'm being honest, but I swear she had contempt in her face. Part of me wondered whether I'd be offending her by staring, so I diverted my eyes and kept walking. I tried to tell myself that maybe she was homeless. Maybe she was wearing the only thing she had, and I was just being rude. But the warning bells were still going off in my head. I'm not a paranoid person, so having my sixth sense going off like that was very unsettling. I have a fantastic peripheral vision, so I turned my face toward Rick and acted like I was listening to him, but I was watching the creepy woman out of the corner of my eye. The moment we passed, she spun her head around to study us, and she slowed her pace. My internal alarms grew louder. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her come to a stop and drop her face toward at the ground. Her body half turned on the trail. It was very odd behavior. Rick and I kept walking around 50 yards further. We made it around a bend in the path and I looked back at the woman before the trees obscured her view. She was still standing there. Her face was down, but she was staring a hole through us out of the corner of her eyes. That was the first time I realized that I couldn't see her hands. One was inside her jacket pocket, and the other was hidden from my view on the other side of her body. It creeped the hell out of me. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. For half a mile, I didn't see her again, and had begun to wonder whether the first woman, the co-ed, had felt danger as well. Clearly she had, I thought, and that's why she was practically running through the woods at dusk. It also struck me that the woman was stopping and studying Rick and me, like she was deciding on whom to follow. We weren't moving as fast, we were walking as quickly as Rick could manage, and he was clearly more female than a co-ed. But those thoughts amped my senses and I felt very uneasy, so I periodically checked behind us. At certain points through the woods, I could see more than 100 yards, and nothing. I began to worry about the co-ed. My hair stood up for a second time as I felt the strongest sensation of being watched. Again, thinking I was paranoid and half mocking myself for being afraid of the creepy woman, I turned my head around to assure myself she was not back there. I was wrong. She was there, following with her head down and moving briskly about a hundred yards behind us, but with her hands hidden. I turned my head back to the trail in front of us and kept walking, still trying to convince myself that there was nothing out of the ordinary happening. That I was just being rude because she was dressed like a homeless woman. About 200 yards further along the path, I turned my head back to Rick and my heart raced a bit. She had closed half the distance. Each time we walk around a bend in the woods obscured her location, she would emerge closer and closer to us. I told myself that I was just being paranoid, but, but nevertheless, I tried to get Rick to pick up the pace. By this time, he was clearly aware that we were being followed, and he was pretty uncomfortable as well. Though, to his credit, he did keep walking. With half a mile to go before we reached the parking area, I turned my head once again, and she was just ten feet behind us. I hadn't seen or heard her get that close, and it freaked me out. I literally jumped. One of her hands was in her pockets, and the other was behind her back. I got the distinct feeling she had a weapon of some kind, 
and that she had no fear of despite the fact that I was considerably taller, albeit several years older. There was no mistaking her demeanor. She meant to do us harm, or at the very least she intended to intimidate us. I weaved my car keys between my knuckles. I handed my water bottle to Rick, and made an obvious fist with my left hand. With a half mile left in our hike, I thought to myself, if this is nothing, she'll pass us and move on, as clearly she's moving a lot faster than we are. I was accustomed to people overtaking us, but she didn't pass, and never acted like she knew we were there, which was the creepiest part. I kept my head toward turned her, as I walked and tried to get her to make eye contact, but she didn't look me in the eyes at first. She kept acting like neither Rick nor I were on the path a few feet ahead of her, and she'd followed so closely behind. I was completely unnerved, and that made me angry. I wanted her to see how pissed I was, and to convey with a look that messing with me was a mistake. When she finally did make eye contact with me, I glared and clenched my fist. There was an instant where I couldn't read her expression. She was simply blank, but as she studied my face she appeared simultaneously agitated and a little less confident. I was conveying one thing on my face, back the fuck off. And at this point, I didn't give a damn if it appeared rude. She apparently thought better of whatever she was doing and slowed her pace so that the distance between us grew to about 20 feet, but she was tense and kept whatever she had in her hand hidden behind her. I never saw her hands. I knew she had a weapon though, and I believe she meant to do us harm, but I also know she recognized that I was ready to fight. I was mentally prepared to charge at her if I saw a gun or a knife, as I knew Rick could not run her. I thought to myself, I just have to surprise her. I also realized that I needed to have her in front of us. A few hundred feet further, about a quarter mile away from where our car was parked, she still was stalking us and I had enough. I was in equal measures afraid and furious. I told Rick that we were going to stop and let her pass, loud enough for her to hear it. Just as I was getting ready to stop on the trail and make her walk in front of us, she veered into a small clearing, plowing through waist-high brush crossed a ditch and scurried through a tree line to a road that ran through the woods in between the main road and the parking area. I kept my eyes on her the entire time. She had a car. It was parked alongside the little service road, partially hidden by shrubs, not in the parking lot. The last time we made eye contact just before she climbed in her car, it was clear from the expression on her face that she was very angry. I glared at her, expressing my own anger, and kept walking. When her car started and she drove away, Rick got quiet before asking me, what in the hell was she doing? Did she have a gun? I told him I didn't know. I never saw a weapon. We walked back to our car without saying another word. Once the engine was on and the doors were shut, we chatted a bit more and decided to call the authorities and report the incident and to make sure to have them check the poor co-ed who had passed first. To this day, I have no idea what the creepy woman was planning to do. I don't know if she wanted to rob us, harm us, scare us, I have no idea. I am just thankful she decided better of it. I have hiked that trail more than 50 times since then, but I've never seen her again. I live in northern New South Wales, Australia, in an area where the bush is quite dense. Now, I've always been into the paranormal and have experienced a few situations that just cannot be explained. The one I'm about to tell is the most freakiest one so far. So here's a backstory that links into the story I'm about to tell. So I live with my parents and my two brothers. About a year back, we were staying with some friends in a tiny desert town with a population of 200. I know, it is very tiny. We heard about an older man who lived in one of the houses and was murdered about four years back. The locals suspected the murderer to be a dodgy, dirty homeless man who was lingering around the children and just being completely and utterly creepy, so they kicked him out of the town. This man had a tattoo on his forehead saying, Mom. Now, fast forward to when we were camping in the bush. 
We went for a drive on a day that I was going to have a shower in a place where you paid about two bucks for a shower if you were camping close by. Anyway, we parked and noticed a man with a small puppy trying to hitchhike. Me being a nice person, decided to ask him where he was going and let him know my father could probably drive him. Now, when I sit in my back passenger seat, it sometimes looks like I'm the one driving. So, I'm assuming he thought I was alone, as he seemed perfectly fine at first, but then hesitant when he noticed our Rottweiler and the rest of my family. They gave him a lift while I had my shower. I don't know why, but I got a bad feeling. They took a little bit longer than usual. They came back in shock. It was the same fucking man with a tattoo on his head from that small town. We coincidentally bumped into this possible killer who was last seen in a complete different state four years ago. He was wearing a hat when I spoke to him, so I didn't see the tattoo. My parents told me how crazy bad the vibes were and how quiet everyone was. They even stopped and dropped him off at a public spot so they did not feel that safe at all with him. Now, we are driving back to the camp and we're cracking jokes about how we would be waiting back at the camp for us with coffee. My family was terrible with a sense of humor. We got to the camp at light at night and it was dark. We had two big tents and we slept in a big kitchen tent. I was somehow still in a bit shaken sense, but I somehow decided to grab a knife and put it next to my bed, you know, just in case. I was cleaning off my knife when I heard something walking behind the tent. I called out to my little brother and he replied that he was in the campfire with everyone else including the dog. I suddenly became very frightened and without even thinking looked next to me inside the food tent and the only way I can describe it was that I seen this old, dirty man crouching down in the dark, breathing heavily and looking me dead in the eyes. I froze for a second and screamed like I have never before and I began running to everyone else. I was getting ready to call the police but once my dad walked in with a huge stick, it was like he just vanished. It was just like, it didn't make sense. There was so much food in that tent that no one could have really been in it without crushing everything. Plus, nothing was even moved when we looked inside. When things settled down and we couldn't find anything around, we eventually all tried going to sleep. After about 10 minutes of trying to sleep and still horrified from whatever the fuck I had just seen, I started hearing footsteps around the tent. It went on for about 5 minutes. I listened very carefully. This thing had two feet, and it sounded heavy and big. To try and possibly scare it off, I told my brother very loudly to grab the knife and see what's outside. Everyone else admitted to hearing it also. My dog started barking and followed my brother outside. She then chased whatever it was into the forest. My brother couldn't see it, but he said it was running our dog, and it sounded as if it were dragging something heavy. After about 15 minutes, we tried going back to sleep. Just before I managed to get some sleep, a voice from outside very faintly said my dog's name. My dog didn't make a sound for the rest of the night. Now, I don't know if this had absolutely anything to do with that day, but I fell asleep that night and my face towards the tarp wall. I had the craziest vivid nightmare. I'll try to explain the nightmare as I can. It was like I was face to face with an autopsy of a young blonde American girl. She was speaking into my ear, going into details about how she was murdered, how her body was found, and how good her life was beforehand. I tried looking away from the body, but everywhere I turned my head, I was just looking at a different part of the body while she still spoke. This dream went on until she said a name of a man, and then I woke up. I don't remember the name, and it was not familiar to me. Anyway, that was probably the scariest strangest night I have ever experienced and I no longer enjoy camping. I hope you enjoyed my story as much as I enjoyed listening to everyone else's experiences. This story happened to me when I was hiking in the woods. It was about 3 a.m. so there was no light yet. There is rarely people up there and there are no trails. It's mostly trees and hills and wild cows. I was walking down a hill and I thought why not do some exploring. So I decided to go down a few more hills until I was on flat ground. I looked around and saw what looked like a trailer. I decided to go into it. 
I had my gun in my hand, just in case some crazy bear or something tried to kill me. Anyway, when I was inside the trailer, I nearly threw up. It smelled like sulfur, but extremely bad. I walked further into it and saw a bed, a bag, and some books on black magic. Then I left because I couldn't stand that smell anymore. I left the trailer and continued walking. I came across a house, well, maybe a bit bigger. I was like, why not go in there, and so I went in. I saw the same books and I was kind of creeped out. Then I went upstairs and saw that there was some stuff on the second floor. I heard something move and I got a terrible feeling of bad energy. Then I decided to yell for whatever reason at whoever was up there. I said, I know you're up there motherfucker, say something. But there was complete silence. I shot my gun through the roof and this time heard a scuffle. The sun had started rising now, so I decided it was best to leave. Before I left, I saw something written on the stair. It said, House of Spirits. I booked it out of there, and I felt the same feeling of being watched and scared. I turned around and there was a man on the roof. He was staring at me. He had a long beard and long hair. He was smiling at me, and I felt so disturbed. I shot at the man and yelled at him, but he kept smiling. I ran back to keep an eye on him, and I booked it into the truck. I always see that man around town, but I guess he doesn't recognize me. A few years have passed and my father's friends know him. He is always at the library. He gives everyone bad vibes and stuff, but I'm lucky to be alive. He was a devil worshipper and could have killed me, and no one would have known where to find our car. Anyway, I won't be going near their house again. This happened about two to three years ago. I live in northwestern Montana, and it was my senior year summer. And I was going through some personal stuff that year, and I thought the best way to escape from that was to get off the grid and go camping in the forest. My plan was to go on a hiking trail that not a lot of people hike on, and get to this small campsite. I packed my gear that everyone brings on hiking trips, food, water, tents, bear spray, etc. When I left, it was after work and it took a couple hours to reach the beginning of the trail. The hike was 10 miles into the forest which had winding paths, rocky areas, and thick and overgrown brush that at times was hard to see the trail because of how overgrown the trail has been with the lack of people taking it. The trail just led you deeper into the mountains. The hike was pretty uneventful until I reached the campground. When you come out of the trail into the campground, the first thing you see is a small open area about 30 to 50 feet, just, just enough to hold a couple tents. And when you look in front, you can see a small lake with trees packed together tight, and it's hard to see through right above the Rocky Mountains, sticking up high in position to where the sun goes over. The surrounding area is covered in pine trees, making it hard to see more than 20 feet in front of you. When I reached the campground, I set up my tent right away because the sun was going down fast in the mountains. When I reached the campground, I set up my tent right away because the sun was going down fast and with the mountains there, it grew dark quick and since I have had nothing to eat, I got a fire going and put some food on. And here's where it starts to begin. Nightfall came. The night was calm and just a small breeze was coming to make the trees just move enough to where it starts to make karaoke noises. The night was pretty chilly, and I made a pretty good fire. About an hour into the night, I got this foul smell that just seemed to linger around. It must have been coming from the wind, is what I thought anyway. But the smell was strong and felt like it was right next to me. I threw another log on the fire, and then I hear this scream of what sounded like a woman next to me coming from the direction where the wind was coming from. At least. I think. It freaked the hell out of me because I thought I was the only person up here. I didn't see any other tents and there's no place to set up tents other than the spot I'm in and the scream didn't come from the trail I came from. The visibility that night came from the campfire and the moon reflecting off the lake so I couldn't see far. But 
I reached into my backpack and pulled out a flashlight and just slowly started scanning the area for a woman. I yelled back, Are you okay? What's wrong? And the woman yelled back, Help me! So, I said, Where are you? Are you hurt? Trying to find the source of the sound, there was a small pause and then she yelled back, Come here! But there was something off about the voice. I just kept thinking to myself, that woman didn't sound like she was hurting or anything was really attacking her. So that raised a red flag in my mind, and everything I said seemed like it didn't matter to the woman. Like she was just trying to lure me out of the campsite with some two words. Help me! Right after that, I reached into my backpack and pulled out my handgun and kept scanning the forest. After a bit, I could hear far in the distance elk making noises and right after the elk finished, I hear the loudest high-pitched screech that I've ever heard in my life, in the same direction the girl was yelling at me from, and after the screech I hear movement in the direction of the elk, with the bushes moving violently until the bushes became unmoving and the campground came to a standstill again. After the thing ran away, the foul smell went with it, and though the rest of the night was calm except for the same screeching in the distance which sounded like it was miles away, just echoing through the mountains. I have never been more scared in my life. So, I waited until dawn, packed up my things, and headed home. I haven't told anyone my story, but if you have any idea what this could be, please let me know. I guess I should start by saying, this happened in early September of 2016. I'm a 25 year old female that lives in a really rural part of northern Arkansas with my fiance. Near the lake to be exact. It's gorgeous. Lots of open farmland, plenty of woods, and barely any neighbors. It's what my soul always wanted. I am an only child. Also, and have been pretty much spoiled my whole life. My father, for as long as I can remember, would randomly bring home toys. Not just little toys, I'm talking go-karts, dune buggies, and even four-wheelers. So, since I was young, I knew how to drive just about any off-road vehicle, and I loved it. We even had jet skis at one point. My parents were very laid back with me, to the point that they would nap during the day and let me ride the dune buggies until dark. I forgot to mention, I just recently moved full-time to the property. For years, we would only visit the land on the weekends. So it's a different feeling knowing you don't have to go back to town. My parents live about three hours away from the land, so seeing them on the weekends is a treat. They bring up all kinds of goodies. The land is beautiful, about 30 acres more than half of which is cleared. Years ago, a small farm was here. The old barn still stands and of course a pond with a ton of frogs. One night, we all got wild hair and decided to go for a night ride. My father now has a jeep, so him and my fiance decided to ride together. Me and my mother decided to ride separate on the wheelers. These four wheelers are fairly new, automatic so they are ready to ride a while. And damn it, I also forgot to mention that for miles outside of the property is the Cherokee Wildlife Reservation, so there are miles and miles of woods and dirt trails, so many that you could be gone all night. Behind the property about 20 minutes out is a creek. Once you pass through it, you will go up the mountain on the other side of Cherokee. There's also a crap ton of logging roads. But before you get to the logging trails, there's a dirt road you have to take. I have taken this road for years. I have had some weird feelings out there. But this night will be the night that I will always remember until I die. My dad, fiance, uncle and aunt had gone ahead of us. Five minutes ahead of us to be exact. My mother and I had been out making a drink. Yes, my wheeler was a cup holder and I was going to bring alcohol with me, damn it. After we passed through the creek and up the mountain, I noticed the beams of my mother's wheeler start to dim. Normally, they do this because your fan too cool engine has kicked on. So, I didn't think anything of it. I want to let you know that there are houses near the end of this road and near the beginning. So there's a gap of about 5 miles long of woods and an occasional dirt road for gas as well. By the way, gas wells are everywhere up here. As we get closer to the trail, we are supposed to take, my mother's wheeler starts backfiring. 
We stop for a second to see what's going on, when it dies. Now, like I said, I've been out in these woods my whole life. I wasn't afraid at all. No weird things or feelings or anything. My mother calls to my dad and tells him what's going on, but no calls are getting through. They must be going down the mountain, my mother said with an aggravated tone. I turn off my wheeler, but leave the lights on. The road is narrow, so narrow that two cars can barely squeeze by. I don't want some drunk guy flying around the corner and not seeing us. As my mother tries to call my dad again, I start looking at her wheeler. Something isn't right with it. There's power to it, but no fuel is getting to the engine, which could be a lot of things causing that. So I get my phone out and text my fiance, letting him know we were stuck in the middle of the road. We were sitting there for a good 10 minutes, when all the hairs on my body start to stand up. I immediately look, look in the direction of the headlights to see a, a man walking from the pitch darkness. He had no light and he said nothing. It took a second for my brain to register what I was seeing. As my mother finally got my dad on the phone, I whispered to her sternly, Mom, there's a guy walking up on us. Now, my mother tends to panic at times. I never took my eyes off him. He was still far enough away that I couldn't make out much features. My mother is freaking out and I tell her to leave the shit and jump on my four-wheeler. As she does, I yell to the guy who is obviously getting closer. Hello, what the hell? He said nothing. This seriously freaked me out. Like who the hell walks down a pitch dark road in the middle of the night without a light? And not say something as you approach other strangers. That's when it dawned on me. He must have been creeping in the woods down the road. Voices echo like crazy out there, so he probably knew we were women. Normally, I keep a 38 on me, but my silly ass left it at home. Out of all times, this would be the one time that I forgot it. I start my wheeler up and my mother hops on. The man is still getting closer. Now I can make out a red flannel shirt and dirty jeans, dark hair, but not much more. He had a gun. Not in his hand, but visible on his hip. He still wasn't saying a word, which makes us kind of panic even more. He also was not looking at us, but rather at the ground. I realize I can't back up because I can't see a damn thing behind us. So I threw it in high and took Poff past him. As we passed him, he just stood there, facing and following our direction, yet never looking up at us. It was pretty disturbing. We make it near through the creek, and my mother was able to tell my dad everything. He immediately turned around when he heard us yelling. He was at the wheeler in about four minutes. As we met back at the wheeler, the guy is there, on his own wheeler. My mother and I just sat there, staring at this weirdo. He never gave me or my mother eye contact, and ended up heading to the creek to talk. As we all shut our vehicles off, my dad asked us, so, uh, where did he come from? I told him, the darkness. He just walked up without a light from the road. My fiance chimes in. He had a wheeler in and toe straps. Y'all didn't talk to him or anything? My mother and I just stared at him with open mouths. This guy was going to take our wheeler. He never asked us if we needed help. He didn't say or do anything but act weird. The man had told my dad his wife and her people yelling in their driveway. We didn't even pass their driveway. The next day, me and my fiance head to the same spot to check out this driveway. We reached just about halfway there when the four-wheeler had died, and just a few hundred yards down the road was an overgrown driveway. We drove up and decided to walk the rest of the way. Tucked far behind the woods was a rundown barn-like cabin, with no power, no vehicles, and no signs of recent life, and definitely no sign of a wife. There was an outhouse behind the barn. As we walked up to the windows, we noticed the man's wheeler sitting behind the barn. I looked at my fiancé who had a worried look on his face. Inside the barn was stuff that you would expect to see in a garage, no indication that someone was living there. As we backed away slowly, I start to notice that there were vans hidden in the woods, like a homestead. They were run down and I'm pretty sure they didn't run, but still. And that's when my fiancé grabbed my hand and we quickly got back to the jeep. On the way back home, I told him about the vans. He said that he noticed them too. He noticed them at the same time he noticed the man, staring at them from inside the barn. Always bring protection if you're going to be in the middle of nowhere.
One time, while driving in the middle of nowhere in France with a friend, the whole night just felt so eerie for some reason. I won't get into all the prior details, but when we parked in front of our hotel, it was strangely quiet and dark. All of a sudden, a group of people in a trance-like state started walking out of the woods from different areas all around the parking lot. The woods were just about a foot away from where we parked our car. It was so creepy and intense. The first person to come out of the woods was a lady. She didn't even acknowledge us as she walked right in front of and beside our car. She was so tranced out. More people hide in the woods than you would think or imagine. Another day, I was walking in the woods in my backyard. I often walked alone in there feeling safe and solace. Once I was pretty far in, I turned around to Ben and was scared out of my wits to see a snaked man just laying there on the side of the path. He must have been slinking his way through the woods to get there before I did or maybe he was just laying there for a long time just waiting for someone to see him or walk into him. I ran like a bat out of hell, thinking he was going to kill me. It's safe to say there are a lot of creepy people as well as creepy creatures lurking out in the woods just outside of our homes. Before I tell you my story, I must give you a bit of background. I live in the state of Idaho in the US. I work on a farm and live in a very small town and live just down the road about an hour from where this happened. But when I heard a story from a neighbor, curiosity got the best of me. My friend Bill told me the story of the water babies. We were at my house in the garage. Bill was talking with my dad about fixing something in the house. The talk moved on to hunting stories, then stories about seeing weird things in the woods. My dad has a ton of stories like that handed down from my grandpa. After a few stories, Bill told the tale like this. You see, the story behind the water babies is that two main native tribes in the area, the Shoshone and the Bunak, or as they call themselves, the Shobans, would perform an ancient ritual. Nobody remembers any specifics of the ritual. It's lost to history, but the purpose is fairly well known. Whenever a set of twins were born, the Shobans would take the babies to the marsh where the Blackfoot and Snake Rivers joined. They would throw the babies in the water, and the one that floated was kept, and the ritual was ended. The belief is that the twin is good, and the other twin is evil, and they believed uh, that the good one would float to the surface, but this meant a lot of babies drowned, whether one or both the twins died. Anyways, it is said that if you drive to Tilden Bridge, which overlooks the smaller of the two rivers, and shut your car off, you will hear odd noises, small thuds and thumps, as if something is crawling all over your car. I have heard of water babies before, and seen the Tilden Bridge, but I never joined and put the two together in my mind. After Bill told us what water babies were, he told me that after his brother experienced the noises and his friends, they drove away from the bridge on a dirt road. The next morning, Bill's brother got up to find his car not only caked in dust, but covered in small hand footprints. I scoffed at this. It's a fairly lesser known local legend, although old timers are dying out, so it's not as well known anymore. And I never believed it. Until one night two years ago. A group of me and my friends, I was the one driving, and my cousin in the cab, and my girlfriend in the middle front seat, her best friend in the passenger, and the other two girls were in the back. We wanted to spook out the girls, and in all honesty, we all were pretty creeped out as it was. We told them we were looking for ghosts and it was a moonlit night, so if we did see anything, we would be kind of screwed. This amped up the fear of the unknown factor big time. I was driving so I parked and turned my pickup off the middle of the bridge. It is a rarely used bridge due to it being in the middle of nowhere, so I felt comfortable parking on the bridge. We sat in the darkness for a minute expecting something to freak us out. The car was full of us kids being loud and goofing off, so it wasn't too creepy. After a minute or two, we decided to leave nothing, because it was too spooky and nothing was happening. The mist of the river rolled over my truck's windows, which made everything look more horrifying. To tell you the truth, we all decided to do something else, so I turned the key and nothing happened. The girls thought I was playing around and telling me to push it in the clutch or just joking. Idiots, let's go. 
My girlfriend told me, not funny, okay? Just go. I told him that the car was an automatic and had no clutch. The girls grew quiet, and I saw them go pale in the moonlight. I tried for about a half an hour to get the car to start, but it just wouldn't work. I was too scared to get out and pop the hood. Everyone was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I kept turning the key, and my girlfriend's best friend in the passenger seat had her window down a small bit through the small slit of the window. We heard a baby screaming not too far from the river bottoms. Mind you, we were miles from the nearest town or any farms, so it couldn't have been some baby a little ways off, because we were in the middle of nowhere like I said before. We were literally like a half an hour from the nearest town. We then started hearing soft thuds and bumps of the roof and hood of the truck. We all freaked out after a few turns, the engine still wouldn't go, until we heard a thud and felt the truck move forward a bit. I turned the key one last time and it started up. We pulled out of there as fast as we could over the dirt road. We were all done with doing anything else that night, so I took everyone home. When everyone was dropped off at home, I drove back to my house parked the truck in the driveway and ran inside. The next morning, my dad yelled at me for letting kids climb over the truck during the night. I told him I wasn't, I wasn't even near any kids last night. He led me to the driveway to the truck and, and said, see all the hand and footprints all over? The truck was covered in dust from the dirt road and as he pointed to it, I noticed small handprints and footprints on the hood and in the bed. It's been two years but I will never go back to Tilden Bridge again. I have experienced some weird crap in my life, but all I know is that I believe in Bill's story.